Good morning, everyone. Why don't we stand together as we prepare to worship? Psalm 145 says, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Let's lift our voices together. We are a sea of voices. We are an ocean of your praise. Gathered under one name, we are a tide that's rising, and we cannot be contained. Gathered under one name, oh, for a thousand times to see the glories of our Lord, God Almighty, oh, to sing the Savior's praise, the triumph. where sin was slain, gathered under one name, where every chain is broken, and every sorrow swept away. is worthy today of our songs, uh, worthy of us gathering together in his name. We're so glad that you're here today. If you're visiting with us, you're our special guest. We'd love to get to know you better and get to know how we can serve you better. And the best way for us to do that is if you'll tear out that communication card that was in your bulletin you were handed when you came in, uh, tear that out, fill it out, and just turn it into anybody with a Station Hill name tag on as you're leaving. We'd be so grateful. But today is the day that the Lord has made. We're going to continue to rejoice and be glad in it. Right now, shake a few hands around you, say good morning, and we will continue to sing together. standing. Let's make this our prayer today. Sing this hymn with me. 
testimony together and I was lost in utter darkness till you came and rescued me and I was bound by all my sin when your love came and set me free and now my soul can sing a new song now my
sing together. Isn't the name of Jesus beautiful? Isn't the name of Jesus beautiful? Son of God and one of us, lover of our souls. Isn't the name of Jesus beautiful? Eternal King. Eternal King, you will reign forever, and we will sing the glory of your name. Be lifted high for all the world to see, your name is all they need, your name is all we need. Isn't the name of Jesus powerful? Isn't the name of Jesus powerful? Chains are broken when it's spoken, every knee must bow. Isn't the name of Jesus powerful? Lift it up, eternal King. Eternal King, you will reign forever, and we will sing the glory of your name. Be lifted high for all the world to see, your name is all they need, your name is all we need. Eternal Eternal King, you will reign forever, and we will sing the glory of your name. Be lifted high for all the world to see, your name is all we need, your name is all we need.
we'll sing. Isn't the name of Jesus all we need? He's the way, the truth, the life, the only way to God. Isn't the name of Jesus all we need? He's the way. He's the way, the truth, the life, the only way to God. Isn't the name of Jesus all we need? Isn't the name of Jesus all we need? Amen. God, we praise you. May we see. And last week was uh, an amazing Sunday from uh, beginning to end. We saw so many come forward for baptism in our annual night of worship baptism service. And, uh, but here again this Sunday, uh, two people in this service, four people across the morning have come forward for baptism today. And so we celebrate that. First, we have Derek Coates coming for baptism. And this is... Uh, I'm sorry, Robert being baptized by his father, Derek, and this is Robert's testimony. Hello, my name is Robert Coates. I first started thinking about being a Christian at VBS this summer. I believe that it's God's plan and the right thing to do. I know I'm a sinner and Jesus saved us from our sin on the cross. He saved me from my sin. My favorite Bible story is Jonah and the well. I like how God used the well to help Jonah do his work. I now want to tell all my friends about Jesus. Is that your testimony? Yes. Well, based on your profession, I baptize you now, my son and my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Praise the Lord. Uh, now Maddie Pixley is coming to be baptized by her father. This is Maddie's testimony. I'm Maddie Pixley, and I want to get baptized because Jesus died on the cross for me and everyone around me. I grew up in a Christian home my parents always talked about the amazing love of God, and every night my dad would read the Bible to me and my mom would sing a hymn to me. They remind me through all the tough times that God is there for me. My dad always says God will help us through the tough times. Without God, I'd be incomplete. I knew I was ready to, get, to accept God as my Savior after the hardest trial of my life. I felt lonely and scared, but I prayed every night things would get better, and they did all thanks to God's work. I knew he was always there for me and that he had an amazing future planned for me. I've accepted God as my savior. I know that I'm a sinner and Jesus has paid for my sins by dying on the cross and that was a very good thing that he did for us. Madeline, that is your testimony, right? And it's based upon that confession that I'm so pleased to baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism, and raised to walk in a new life. Amen. It's amazing how um, worship can put things in perspective for us. And today's been a day like that for me. It has been a crazy, stressful week at the Swords household. We've been moving this weekend, which as you know is stressful anyway, but to add to that, um, up until Friday morning, we weren't sure where we were gonna actually move our stuff, because we had to get out of our house, but we weren't sure if our new house was gonna be ready, we weren't sure if we we're gonna get to put our stuff in there, or leave it on a truck, or put it in storage, or just throw it all out in the yard. We just weren't really sure what was gonna happen, but I have this saying that I use a lot when life gets crazy and stressful and we're not really sure what's gonna happen, I say there are real problems in the world and this is not one of them. And I say it sometimes, 25 times a day, <laughs> which it has been this week. There are real problems in the world, this is not one of them. Um, and so you're welcome to use it. It's just a great little phrase that I use, but 
the reality of it is that when I can take my eyes off of whatever's happening here and I can put my eyes on God and I can put my eyes on his sovereignty and his plan and know this is just a season, it'll pass, we'll get through it. What's important is um, the grace and mercy that we have in Jesus Christ. And so it helps put, make all the everyday crazy stuff just a little bit more manageable. But we know that there are real problems in the world. And one of those real problems in the world is lostness, is global lostness, is people, is unreached people groups, people who will be born and live their entire lives and die having never heard the name of Jesus that we've just sung about all morning. And so here at Station Hill, we pray for a different unreached people group every month. Um, This month we are going to pray for the Maratha people of India. So please pick up a card on the table on your way out and pray for them. This is a a people group that I'm very familiar with. Um, I have friends who go into this people group every single month and they work with national believers to plant churches. Um, And there are Believers, it, it shows up statistically as 0.00% because they're, this is a, one of the largest people groups in India. There's 30 million people, 30 million in this people group. Um, but we know of a couple of thousand believers among the, among the Maratha people. And I've personally been there. I've personally had the privilege of walking into a village where Jesus' name has never been heard and getting to share the gospel with those people. And it's an amazing thing to watch what he does. But my friends are there. They work tirelessly. They work with national believers. And then they work with um, new believers who are turning around and making disciples. So um, they are so excited that we're going to pray for them this month. Um, So let's do that in just a few minutes. Um, Also, speaking of missionaries, Jamie Lambert and I will be heading uh, heading overseas this week to go spend time with our missionaries, the ones that Brentwood um, supports, and so we're going to get to go have a chance to hang out with them and listen to their stories and encourage them and worship with them and um, pray with them, so you can pray for us as we get ready to leave on Tuesday. Um, And last but not least, uh, we want to take a moment today to pray for Chris Blanton, our student minister, who I think is with the students probably. He is about to go on sabbatical. So if you are familiar with the Brentwood system, every five years, our church graciously allows full-time ministers a month uh, away for kind of soul care and a chance to get away and um, study and learn and just regroup and refresh. And so today is Chris's last Sunday uh, for the month of September. And so we just want to pray for him. We want to pray for his family, that they will all stay healthy and well and um, be well taken care of so that he can be free from distraction and um, be able to go and um, just hear from the Lord in a way that sometimes everyday busy ministry um, can get in the way of. So we want to pray for him. And of course, we want to pray for Jay as he comes to to bring us our message today. So let's take time to do that right now. Lord, we are so thankful for rest. We are so thankful that we have the opportunity as your children, God, to rest in you, rest in your promises, rest in your grace, rest in your mercy, Lord. 
Your word says to us, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. And so we are so grateful for that, God. And we pray right now for Chris as he gets ready to go and have this month, um, Lord, that you would pour into him, God, so that when he returns, he will be ready to um, pour back into our students and into our next gen um, ministries. Lord, we're grateful for him. and. Um, pray that you will just be with him and guide him, protect his family while he's gone, Lord. And God, we do want to lift up the Marada people to you today, God. We know that you are um, so aware of the situation that they're in, God. We thank you right now. We praise you for the believers that you have drawn from the Marada people, Lord. And for workers who are willing to go in spite of the risks, God, that are willing to go and share the love of Jesus with those people. God, we know that when your word is proclaimed, it never returns void. And so we are so thankful for the way that you're using that and using those people. And God, help us this month as a church to call out on behalf of the Marada people. And God, we pray for this service, um, what you're gonna do here, right here in this room, Lord, this morning. We thank you for the four people who have been baptized, God, and their testimonies. We're so grateful for the work that you've done in those lives. And we pray, God, that if there's anyone here today who has not yet made that decision, God, that today would be the day of their salvation. We love you, Lord. We pray all of these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. During this sermon series, which is all about disciples who make disciples, you're going to be hearing a lot about gospel conversations. So what exactly is a gospel conversation and why is it important? Well, gospel conversations is a conversation you have with a lost and searching person where you present the person of Jesus Christ. It can be a long conversation, it can be a short conversation. It can be a conversation that is totally spontaneous. It can be a conversation that you pray and that you prepare for and that you bring up at just the right time, at just the right occasion. It's important to realize that when you have a gospel conversation with someone, that it's not just you and this person talking. The Holy Spirit is there, the Holy Spirit is present, and He will guide and equip you in what you need to say. Keep in mind that you need to be prepared, that you need to be patient, and that you need to be mindful and watching for opportunities to share Jesus with the lost and searching around you. So one way to help you, to equip you to have gospel conversations is the new Gospel Conversations mobile app. This app is designed to help you do three things. First, you can learn about gospel conversations and how to have them with those who are lost and searching. Second, you can record your gospel conversation so that we as a church can see our progress as we try to reach our goal of 500,000 gospel conversations in the next five years. Third, you can request to get help from a gospel conversations coach. These are people just like you and I who have been trained in gospel conversations and can help you better communicate the gospel to the lost and searching. God's story, your story, and their story. You can find the app in either the Apple App Store or in the Google Play Store. Well, good morning, church family. We are committed to giving you the tools that will help you point people to Jesus. And this is one of them. Uh, so I really do. I want you to pull out your phone and either do it right now or make a note to do it this week because we're going to actually use this app in the service next Sunday. Uh, so go to the App Store, Google Play Store. Uh, look for Brentwood Baptist Church. Uh, there's another Gospel Conversations app that comes from the seminary uh, I attended as well. Uh, but look for the one that says Brentwood Baptist Church. Download it on your phone. Uh, begin to become familiar with it because uh, we are more more committed than ever, not only uh, to uh, put the tools in your hands, but to be sure uh, that we get the word of the gospel out. Speaking of technology, uh, I have the privilege today to introduce you to someone very, very special. Will you please give a big Station Hill welcome to our first ever full-time uh, media and technical director, Joel Hilsden uh, and his family. So this is Joel and Laura and their children. Uh, and so I'm gonna hand this to Joel. And uh, Joel, tell us a few things that we need to know about the Hillsdens this morning. Well, uh, we hail from uh, Jerusalem, 
uh, Jerusalem, Israel. Not Kentucky. No, not Kentucky. Right. Good. Uh, Good this is my wife, Laura. I met her in Jerusalem 15 years ago. We've been married uh, coming up on 12 years. Uh, it's my daughter, Noah, born in Jerusalem. My son, Shai, born just up the road in Franklin. And my daughter, Nomi. Hi. <laughs> who was born in Fresno, California. And if you want to know how that all happened, uh, come get to know us. <laughs> yeah, and amazing that they ended up here. And we're so glad that God has brought you guys our way. And we look forward to getting to know you and the family. They've been here all three services, by the way. So give those kids a hand, right? That's a long morning. So way to go, guys. Way to go. All right. Well, Joel, tell us a little bit about kind of your philosophy of media and technology and how that fits with ministry. Uh, so... From my perspective, I've always felt that um, practical ministry, day-to-day -day stuff is not disconnected from uh, spiritual ministry and um, ministering to one another uh, is, in a lot of respects, ministering to God. If you look at the biblical priesthood in the temple, a lot of what they did was just practical, you know, day-to-day -day stuff. Uh, there were priests who were literally janitors, just like there were priests who were musicians, and just like there were priests who stood before the altar and kept the candles lit and all that good stuff. Um, you know, so to me, being at the sound, at the lights, and all that stuff, it's all part of ministry. Yeah, absolutely. And every week uh, we get emails uh, and feedback from people who are watching the messages online, uh, often on Facebook, often through the website, uh, things that you guys repost that come from our media team. Uh, it's pretty amazing the reach today that technology has and how important it is uh, and vital to our ministry. Well, Joel, how do we pray for your family as you guys make this transition? Uh, well, uh, my older two uh, started the school system in Hebrew, so uh, they, they need a little extra help getting along, and so just pray, pray for them. They're doing really well at uh, Marvin Wright. We even have some uh, reading tutors that have been helping them that attend here awesome. at Station Hill, which is cool. Um, and just as we're transitioning in for peace, for um, all of that, uh, that would be great. And I meant to mention this. My dad, who planted... Uh, a church in 1983 in Jerusalem, and is the reason I um, went there, is here this morning. So I wanted to honor my parents who are here. Yeah, welcome. Thank you. Welcome, welcome. That's, that is cool. So I bet you get the reward for the family coming the farthest to attend church here this morning. So, uh, so Brandon or Brian will have their, your door prize uh, on your way out today uh, as well. Now they have to scramble to come up with something really quick. But anyway, uh, I love to do that too. Well, it is an honor to have you guys. We're so excited that you're here uh, and how God's going to use you. And I might be a little intimidated now when I use Hebrew words, right? You're going to have to help me. Uh, so I might be a little self-conscious. I got our own Hebrew tutors in the house. I love it. Let's pray uh, for the Hillsdens as our ushers come to take our tithes and offerings. Uh, Father, we thank you uh, for the fact that you give us resources, that when we use them as a part of your church and your kingdom, they help in a number of different ways to get the message of the gospel out and to lift the name of Jesus high. So Father, we know that that's the passion of the Hillsdens and their family, God, and why they've come all this way to serve your local church because they know that this is where they've been called for this season. So we pray blessing upon them and the children, especially as they transition to life here in Middle Tennessee. God, we can't wait to see how you're going to use them. And this is a reminder in this moment of our giving that you use each and every one of us, God, that we offer you what we have and we uh, watch you use it to bring people to the name of Jesus. So bless these tithes and offerings. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.
I want to show others that Jesus is my Lord and Savior and that I love Him. Ever since I became a Christian, I have wanted to study God's Word more and learn all I can about His Son, Jesus. When Jesus rose again, death was defeated. So when I die, I am actually going to heaven to live with Jesus for eternity. I will go tell others about Jesus and His love for me. I realized it was time to reaffirm my faith in God and renew my walk through life, guided by my Lord and Savior. I want to get baptized because I want to show that I'm a Christian. Perhaps through my public profession of faith, someone else may grow to recognize God's presence all around them. I commit and confess that Jesus has saved me and I want Him to rule over my life. I want to get baptized today to show my faith in Christ. Today I want to be immersed representing the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. From childhood into adulthood, I have followed the Jewish faith. Jesus revealed himself to me as not only Messiah, but my Savior. We thank you for the gift of multiplication. We thank you that in your kingdom, healthy things not only grow, but they multiply until the whole world knows that Jesus is Lord. And so, Father, I thank you for those who are called up and out of Station Hill to step out on faith, to start a new work, to leave what might have been comfortable or familiar to them, but to see their gifts stretched and used on a new mission field and a new community. I thank you for Ridley and Lisa and their leadership and the elders and the team that has come around them. I thank you for the gifts that are being used right now to point people to Jesus. And Father, we can't wait to continue to hear the stories of what you're going to do through Grove Hill Church. I want to be baptized as an act of obedience and an expression of my faith and belief that God loves me. Thank you, Lord, for never letting go of me. Well, praise God, what a night it was uh, last Sunday night uh, to celebrate 14 baptisms uh, and the testimonies. A huge shout out uh, to our parents and to our preschool and children's ministry. The depths of the testimonies, especially from our kids, were just incredible uh, this year. Uh, and so it is amazing to see the gospel taking root uh, and 70 of our people being commissioned uh, to go uh, help launch Grove Hill Church. And so they are meeting there today in that community, sharing the gospel there. Uh, it's fun when we get to be a part of a church that is all about deciding making disciples. And so that's where we jump back in this week. Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 10. Uh, we're going to look uh, at, and literally I told you this was part two of last week's sermon because we're going to pick up, we read the end of Matthew 9. Uh, now we're going to jump into Matthew 10 uh, this week as we continue this series. And as we get there, a little story. When I came to Brentwood 17 years ago this month, I had no idea that I'd ever have the opportunity to preach. Uh, and so it was gr getting near the holidays and the senior pastor said, hey, do you preach? And I said, well, I I'd love the opportunity to try, right? So he said, great, you get the Sunday between Christmas and New Year's, which if you're new to church, it took me a few years to figure this out, but that's kind of international youth or children's minister preach Sunday, uh, that, uh, that Sunday over the holidays. But I was so just excited and grateful for the opportunity. So it was near Christmas time. Uh, I was preaching in just about a week. The holidays were close. Most everybody had left already on Christmas vacation. I'm in the church library. I mean, gearing up, right? I got stacks of commentaries and I'm working on it. And the church librarian comes in and she said, oh, what are you still doing here? And I said, well, I'm, I'm preaching, you know, over the holidays. Holidays. And she said, oh, well, that's great. That commentary is a good one. And I said, oh, I know I'm getting lots of good things out of it. She said, he'll be here on Sunday. And the blood just drained out of my face. Like the guy I'm plagiarizing three fourths of my sermon from, he'll be here on Sunday. Like, did I hear you right? She's like, oh yeah, he sits over on the right hand. I said, don't tell me where he sits, right? I don't want this guy like staring holes in me as I'm butchering this text, this expert, you know, in languages and in theology. And here I am like a 20 something year old youth pastor. And so I got through the sermon that Sunday and it felt okay about it. And so when we were back after Christmas break, I got a call on Monday morning. First thing from the pastor secretary, uh, pastor Mike would like to see you in his office. I thought, oh boy, here it comes, right? What heresy did I preach? Does resignation have one eye or two? I can't ever remember that, you know? So I sat down in Mike's office and Mike said, okay, so I watched the tape. It was VCR tape at the time, right? We called it game film, like athletes. So I watched the tape uh, and for the next time you preach, there's some things we need to talk about. And I said, whoa, what did you say? So well, for the next time you preach, 
you're going to give me a second chance, right? I've got another opportunity. That's pretty much all, all I heard. And he said, well, yeah, if you're a preacher, the only way you learn to preach is by preaching. This should seem obvious to us, right? That if we are called to do something, the way we learn to do it is not just by doing a workbook about it or sitting in a class about it. It's actually by doing that thing. And so when Jesus wanted to equip his disciples for the mission, they didn't just talk about it. Instead, he summoned them and he called them to go out. It's what we're going to read about today. Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 through 15. Stand with me in honor of God's word as we read. Summoning his 12 disciples, he gave them authority over unclean spirits to drive them out and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Jesus sent out these 12 after giving them instructions. Don't take the road that leads to the Gentiles. And don't enter any Samaritan town. Instead, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those with leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you received, freely give. Don't acquire gold, silver, or copper for your money belts. Don't take a traveling bag for the road or an extra shirt, sandals, or a staff, for the worker is worthy of his food. When you enter any town or village, find out who is worthy and stay there until you leave. Greet a household when you enter it, and if the household is worthy, let your peace be on it. But if it is unworthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone does not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly, I tell you, it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Speak, Lord, for your servants listening. Pray with me this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you that you called your disciples to the mission, that there are no spectators when it comes to your disciples, but only participants. Today, Father, I pray that you will convict us that it's not if, but it's how we're called to participate in your mission. So, Father, help us to be disciples who make disciples. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray and all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. So we're spending the first part of this school year really doubling down and talking to you about our strategy as a church. And we made an intentional decision uh, that we want to be a church that partners with Jesus on the mission, that for him, it wasn't just about the seating capacity, but instead it was about sending capacity. And that's what we want to be about as a people. We want to be faithful and obedient with the opportunity that God has given us. So I want to put up again our disciple making map uh, to give you an idea of what we're talking about and to help you understand how all of this fits together. Uh, as we pulled together these three key elements of the disciples of Jesus, as you'll be reminded, we said that this is kind of like a propeller. Uh, the sweet spot is right in the middle. When we believe and follow Jesus, when we are continually being changed by Jesus, then we are thrust out to live on mission with Jesus. So just like a propeller that is in motion, right? These are not static processes that are independent of one another, but instead they all work together. And one of the things about Jesus is, is that he made sure that his disciples were living on mission alongside of him, with him. We have to be careful because sometimes we're tempted to want to do things for God. We need to be reminded that God doesn't need us. But instead, out of his grace, he calls us as disciples to participate with him on mission. And it's why this passage is so important, because it was set up by what we talked about last week. At the end of Matthew chapter 9, in the pivot in Matthew's gospel, uh, from the kingdom discourse to the mission discourse, we see Jesus with the people ministering to their needs. He sees their needs. 
He is moved deeply to compassion, a word that means moved in his guts, right? Moved deeply into action. And the disciples, he tells them the first thing you're supposed to do is to go make a difference, right? No. The first thing that he tells them is to pray because he knows that we need to be dependent upon him and the power of his presence and his spirit working in us because there's not enough good in us to overcome the brokenness in the world. It won't be long before we burn out and we can't handle it. So instead, uh, Jesus instructs his disciples, would you pray to the Lord of the harvest for something specific? Remember what that is? Workers. Would you pray for workers? There's harvest, there's opportunity everywhere, but we need more workers. Now, who's praying that prayer? The disciples. What does Jesus do next? So it's the first word of Matthew chapter 10. Summoning the disciples, he then sends them out. So do you see what's taking place here? Here's our first point this morning. And by the way, I got five, so you better get your pens and paper ready. All right, here we go. Disciples of Jesus who make disciples with Jesus are called to be the answer to their own prayer. You see, Jesus knew the way that we work. We see a need in the world. On your way in today, you saw the display. What breaks your heart in the world? Because we want you thinking about that. What severe emotional, spiritual, physical needs has God placed in my path, in my neighborhood, in my home, in my workplace, at my school, in my community? And what is breaking my heart? And then on the other side of the display, and what are you doing about it? You see, Jesus wanted his disciples to first be dependent upon him, but then he wanted to put their prayers into action. And so we need to talk about this first word called for a couple of minutes this morning. As I was studying this week, this is one of the things that the Holy Spirit was very clear to me about is that there is a lot of confusion, especially if you're raised in church like I was, around the idea of calling. So let's be honest, in our mind, we separate Christians into tiers. And so at the bottom tier, we've got just your everyday, ordinary church attending. You know, I throw some money in the offering plate. I might help with the local mission project, but that's pretty much it, Christian. And we think that that's kind of basic. Then above that, you've got people who are called to ministry. And so a lot of times they go to seminary or they, take, they go to conferences, they attend classes, those kind of things with hopes maybe of getting on a church staff at some point. That's kind of the next tier up. And then at the third and highest tier, and I have a friend with the International Mission Board who puts it this way, he said, you have the few, the brave, the slightly unhinged and crazy, right? who decide to surrender their life to missions and go off on the mission field. And we were like, whoo, we put those people on a pedestal, don't we? Here's the reality. The Bible never talks about calling in that way. It doesn't. As a matter of fact, biblically, do you know when the Bible talks about calling the most? Your salvation. That you are called to salvation. That's the most frequent use of the word calling in the Bible. Is It's related to our salvation. That God calls us out of the darkness and into the light. He calls us from death to life in Jesus Christ. And with that goes some of the things we've sang about this morning. A calling to freedom. A calling to sanctification. And yes, even a calling to suffer for the sake of the gospel. That is for all Christians. But there's two categories, right, of calling that we need to think about because these are the ones that we have to work out in the local church with a counsel from our brothers and sisters between us and the Holy Spirit. And the first one is this. It's the calling of station in our life. This is things like family. Am I called to be married or am I called to be single? These are things like location and vocation, right? What I do and where I'm located, where God chooses for me to live, those things don't happen by accident. So how do I leverage those things for the sake of the gospel? Those are stations in life. But then there is service in life as well. And so we are called to all serve the king. We do it in different ways. We have different platforms, so to speak, for ministry. But the Bible knows nothing, knows nothing of a Christian who is not obedient, a disciple of Jesus who is not called. The problem, all right, is that many of us hide behind this word calling. Well, I'm not called to do that. I'm not called to do that. Listen, if you are a disciple of Jesus, then you are called to participate on mission with Jesus. 
And to not participate with him on mission is to be disobedient to Jesus. Now, your station, your place of service may look different. As we'll see, God may give you a specific uh, assignment for a season or a time in your life. But the reality is, is we are all called to care deeply about the needs around us and to respond to that call, which leads us to point number two this morning, and it's this. The disciples of Jesus are called to start where they are, but to not stop there. It's interesting that this is one of the only places, there's only four of them in the New Testament, that actually list the roll call of the different disciples. And so as you look at the list, you'll notice something interesting. There's a conjunction between each pair and and Jesus never sent them out by themselves. So again, this reinforces the idea that there's not this super elite brand of Christian, right? The solitary pastor or gifted missionary. No, we're all supposed to serve the king in community together and advance the gospel as teams. Jesus never sent the disciples out by themselves. Instead, he sent them out in at least pairs in order to share the gospel. And where are they to go? Well, don't take the road that leads to the Gentiles and don't enter any Samaritan town. Instead, go to the lost sheep of Israel. Michael Wilkins in his commentary helps us here. Jesus goes first to Israel to fulfill the salvation historical order that God established, with Israel being the tool that he will use to bring blessing to the world. Jesus' attention to Israel underscores God's faithfulness to his covenant promises, the continuity of his purposes, and his plan for Israel. So how many of you in this room have been at some point, and it can be national or international, it can even be like downtown Nashville, but how many of you have been on some kind of a mission journey, some kind of a mission trip that took you overnight? Let me see a show of hands. Okay, good. Yeah, about 50%, maybe two thirds. Uh, About 50% of our folks have, have been a part of that. When we go on these mission journeys, we go for a period of time, it's pretty defined, usually a week or two, to go help a specific partner with a specific need in a specific place. Jesus was doing much the same thing here. So I have heard evangelical Christians try to use this passage to say, I'm supposed to only go right to my hometown or the places right around me. I'm not supposed to go overseas. Remember that by the end of Matthew, Jesus will issue the great commission that says to go to all nations. Translation, you are supposed to start where you're at. There were specific lessons Jesus wanted his disciples to learn on this world's first short-term mission trip about what it meant to reach their uh, Jewish brethren. But they were able to use word pictures. They were able to teach in ways that they could understand. All of those things were important. But we are supposed to start where we're at with our neighbors, but not stop until all of the nations have heard the message of Jesus. So who is supposed to go? All disciples are supposed to go and participate in the mission. Where are we supposed to go? We are supposed to start where we're at, but don't stop there. What are we supposed to say is point number three for us today. And I love this. The disciples of Jesus are called to bring good news to people in great need with great grace. Jesus gives the disciples a one sentence sermon to memorize. Because for most of us, let's be honest, we could probably only memorize one sentence, right? But he starts with this, and I'm sure they expounded on it, elaborated on it, where they went in conversations, those kind of things. But there's one sentence. As you go, proclaim. That word means herald. This is news, life-changing news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. The kingdom of God has come near. Now, when you think about the first century audience, that the disciples were going to, many of these were men who lived in Israel and definitely felt like there was spiritual elitism that was taking place. That there were spiritual categories. There were scribes and teachers of law and Pharisees and Sadducees and on and on it went. So for many of them, they felt they were distanced from Yahweh that it was difficult, if not impossible, to keep the whole law in order to please God. So the news that instead of religion being about what you do to get to God, but instead about what God has done to come to us in Christ Jesus would have captivated them. That would have been good news indeed. And so what your lost and searching friends that God has already placed you around need to hear is there is a God who is near. As Paul says in Acts 17, he is not far away from any one of us. That is good news. 
And Jesus talks about the great need that they would be going to. Heal the sick. There are sick people in our world today who need to know the hope of Jesus. Drive out demons. There are spiritually oppressed people who need to know that Jesus is the only one who can break those chains and save. On and on we could go down the list, but the point here is is that followers of Jesus' disciples, when we hear about great needs in the world, we don't shy away from those, but we see those as opportunities. Opportunities in which the gospel can get through because of the brokenness in someone's life. And so we grow to great, great, or we go uh, in, to great need and we go with the great grace. Jesus reminds them, it's freely been given to you. So now you freely give it away. Grace means we don't earn it. We don't deserve it. But just as Jesus saved and healed you, now you go do that for others. And so for us, we have a message to tell. And we ask the next question, right? Matthew 10, literally a missionary training manual, okay? We've talked about who goes. We've talked about what we say. uh, We've talked about the message that we bring. Now, what do we take along with us on this trip? I love how practical Jesus is right here in these instructions. Here's what we do. We are called to live simply by trusting in God's resources. So Jesus says, don't take a bunch of extra stuff with you. Don't take extra money, right? Part of the lesson, the faith-shaping moment for them and the disciples is to see how God is going to provide everything that they need to accomplish the mission. And we need to be reminded of that because a lot of us, we want to tout out this long list of all these things that we need Jesus to do before we are obedient. No, we're called to be obedient. And then we watch as Jesus supplies everything that we need to fulfill the mission. It's part of how our faith grows in a time like this. I was a youth pastor for 13 years. Oh, I certainly wish I would have known this passage better during my youth pastor days. Here's the reason why. We'd load up students, right, to go on retreats and to go on mission trips and to go to summer camp. And it was always interesting to see what students packed, right? So we're going on a mission trip and we know we're gonna be doing like construction work and girls are packing curling irons and hair dryers and all of these things. Guys, they just pack like an extra t-shirt and some Axe body spray, right? That's all a teenage boy needs. But girls on the other hand, sometimes they would bring suitcases that weighed more than they did. I'm not lying. Probably one of my favorite stories is we were packing up to go on a retreat one time and I saw a girl, she carried up a microwave box. And I was like, surely she just used this box to like, you know, stuff her sleeping bag or pillow in. No, I opened it up and there was a microwave in it. We were going on a retreat. We were going to be gone like 48 hours. It's like, why did you bring a microwave? Because camp food is awful and I just can't stand it, right? So she had brought like her own food and it brought her own microwave along with us. That is not the definition of traveling light, brothers and sisters, okay? (laughs) It's not what Jesus was telling the disciples to do. Instead, he is teaching us Listen, you think you have all these things that you need. Would you just be obedient to me first? I've got the resources. I've already got them laid out for you. Matter of fact, I've already got people in place who are going to welcome you into their homes, who are going to provide for you. We call those in the mission world persons of peace. It's one of the coolest things that I've experienced on some mission journeys is to watch God use people, sometimes people who aren't even believers, but he has placed them there to help the mission, to show his sovereignty to us as his disciples, that God's got this. He knows what he's doing. So that leads us to our fifth point this morning. The disciples of Jesus are called to great risk. Yeah, it's a risk to go share the good news. It's a risk to travel cross-culturally. It's a risk to go to the inner city and to share the gospel with people who are different than you. And let's be honest as well, there are going to be mixed results. Jesus shares with them an old Jewish Hebrew metaphor, right? So about shaking the dust off your feet. Translation, there are going to be people who reject your message and run you out of town. But our job, brothers and sisters, is not to manufacture results. Our job is faithful obedience for the sake of the cross. Look with me at verses 38 and 39. Flip over a page in that same chapter where Jesus tells the disciples, whoever doesn't take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Anyone who finds his life will lose it. And anyone who loses his life because of me 
We'll find it. It's fascinating. We've never lived in an era of greater wealth, more stuff, more distractions, more entertainment, and yet I meet more people than ever trying to figure out life. They're bored. Life feels meaningless to them. What does Jesus say life is? Not finding and building your own little kingdom. It's not about you, but it's about you losing your life in the mission of God that God created you, called you to salvation, put you on this earth, in this place, in this time for a specific plan and purpose to be a part of his mission. And when you discover that, life becomes worth living. Life becomes abundant. Your heart begins to beat fast because you've discovered the mission of God. He who loses his life for the sake of the gospel will find it. It was modeled for us on the cross. So three practical takeaways for us this morning is this. Three takeaways. The first one has to do with the first point that I made about our calling. So every disciple is called to mission. Let's be clear about that. The question is not if we are to serve, but how we are to serve. What are the stations of life in which God has placed me right now, and how do I use those for his glory? What is the specific opportunity to serve that combines who he's created me to be with my spiritual gifts and my talents and experiences so that I can be an effective disciple maker right here where I'm at and then continuing to work out into the world? Number two, our second takeaway today is this. The reality for us is that all disciples are called to reach their neighbors, All of us are called to start where we're at. And many of us, more of us, if we're honest, should go to the nations, even as God is bringing the nations to us, which is an amazing thing. So I think we overlook opportunities right here in Middle Tennessee. Our English as a second language classes will start next weekend. You can pray for those. Last semester with Spring Hill, Tennessee, pretty homogenous people group here, but we had 23 students from 14 different nationalities. Some of them places that we couldn't get into with a short-term team or a missionary if we wanted to. God is bringing the nations to us, so let's start where we're at, but let's not stop going. Let's not stop going to the nations. There's five reasons our missions minister, Leanne, sent us earlier this year via email of why you should think about going on a mission journey. Number one, to encounter the heart of God for the nations. Revelation 5 tells us that heaven will be made up of every tribe, tongue, and people group. And therefore, when we go and we see how God is being worshiped, how God is on the move in other cultures, it deepens and it strengthens our faith and our appreciation for how great our God is. Number two, some of us, let's be honest, we get into a rhythm, we get into a spiritual rut. And when you go and you serve, it jolts you out of that rut. The food tastes different, there are different smells, there are different encounters, right? All of these things. But they lead you to depend on God. Number three, you need to change your perspective. I know that I do sometimes. Living in this culture, I find myself growing entitled. When I find more and more of my emotional energy being consumed with things like, why is the traffic so bad? And why won't this download faster? I need faster internet speeds. I need faster microwaves, right? When I find myself, I'm like, whoa. Leanne was talking about it earlier, right? First world problems. But I become consumed with those things if I don't have perspective. And so going cross-culturally, whether it's inner city, whether it's to rural partners, whether it's across the seas, all of those things give me a perspective that I didn't have and that I needed. Number four, we all love being a part of a great team. And when you go as part of a mission journey, you become a team right away, especially guys. Us guys don't form relationships as much as we forge them. And so when you are serving together shoulder to shoulder, right, to accomplish something to help a mission partner, to get the gospel out, man, you build memories, you make relationships, you have hours to sit in an airport together and learn each other's stories. It's amazing the biblical community that happens when you serve alongside of one another. But fifth, and most certainly the most important, the fifth reason we go is to obey the Great Commission. Because Jesus told us to go. And when we go, we know that he is with us, which leads us to our last takeaway. It's true, some of us right now, you're season of life, you're called here, you're caring for an elderly parent, you've got a mission field right in your office building, students, you've got a mission field in your school. 
It may not be the time for you to go. You need to remain open to going, I believe, but the support of worldwide mission is the responsibility of not just the few, the crazed, the unhinged, right? But it is the responsibility of all disciples of Jesus. Bow your heads with me this morning as we come to this time of response. Every disciple of Jesus is called to be on mission with Jesus. So if you need to, back up into chapter nine. What's the need that you see? What has moved you by the Spirit to care with a deep compassion that kicks you in the guts that says, Lord, would you send workers? Today's question, would you be obedient to be the answer to your own prayer? And go, get involved, serve, whatever it takes. The disciples were ordinary men, transformed by an extraordinary Savior for God's extraordinary purpose and plan. Every one of you who is a disciple of Jesus is called to be involved with the mission of Jesus. So it's not if, but how. Oh Lord Jesus, thank you for sending your disciples then and now. And it's in your name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Stand with us as we sing these words in response this morning. We'll sing together, Eternal King. Eternal King, you will reign forever. And we will sing the glory of your name. Be lifted high for all the world to see. Your name is all they need. Your name is all we need. Eternal King, you will reign forever. And we will sing the glory of your name. Be lifted high for all the world to see. Your name is all they need. Your name is all we need. Isn't the name of Jesus all we need? Isn't the name of Jesus all we need? He's the way. He's the way, the truth, the life. The only way to God Isn't the name of Jesus all we need Let's declare that truth again He's the way He's the way, the truth, the life The only way to God Isn't the name of Jesus all we need Isn't the name of Jesus all we need. Hey Amen. Our first and greatest need is to be saved from our sin and ourselves, to turn away from all those things and to turn to the Savior. And so today, if that's you, then that's why we're here. I'm gonna be down front in just a few moments. Our decision counselors are coming. They'll be to my right and my left. So there are people for you to pray with as you respond to the work of the Spirit through His Word in your heart and in your life today. Maybe today you realize you're not being obedient to participate in the mission and you want a church that's gonna help you how in knowing how. That's why we're here as well. We wanna pray with you and talk with you. Brandon and Brian, they'll be at the back of the Next Steps table. If you wanna connect, learn more about the life of our church, a lot of guests with us on Labor Day. We're so glad you're here. Welcome. Hope you come visit with us again. And then Robert's family and Maddie's family, we want you guys to be down front so people can come by and tell you congratulations uh, right after the service to the two who were baptized as well. So church family, we go to live on mission with Jesus. So you need to know two things this holiday weekend. What are they? You are loved and you are sent. Have a great weekend.